Well, after a couple week break, I want to get back to Psalm 37. And we made it down to verse 15 tonight. Psalm 37 and verse 15. It says, Their sword shall enter into their own heart, and their bows shall be broken. We're also going to look at verse 16 later. A little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of many wicked. So we're going to, uh, these two verses, uh, there's kind of a, a switching of gears there between the two. And that's kind of the neat thing about this psalm is that it does cover a, a vast array of topics. So we get to uh, learn all kinds of different things about the Word of God. So it says that their sword shall enter into their own heart and their bows shall be broken. And the there there is referring to the wicked. If we look back in verse 14, it says, The wicked have drawn out the sword and have bent their bow to cast down the poor and needy and to slay such as be of upright conversation. So if you remember last time, we looked at how uh, the wicked have two primary victims that they look after, they, that they go after, that is the poor and needy and the righteous. So the, those are the two groups of people that they like to go after the most because those are the most vulnerable for one thing. The poor are vulnerable, the righteous are vulnerable because we're not as wise and crafty and wily as uh, the, the people of this world and so therefore we're easily more easily taken advantage of and we're not going to employ the same tactics to fight back against people as wicked people would. So they go after the poor and needy. But the thing is, the Lord is on the side of the poor and the Lord hears the cry of the poor and whenever um, wicked people oppress the poor, then they go to the Lord and they have his ear. If we look in Psalm 69 and verse 33. And then the neat thing is then God, as this verse tells us, then he turns around the contrivances of the wicked and ends up destroying them using their own means and methods. And it's quite interesting. We're going to look at some examples of that tonight. I just love how the Lord, how he does things. Psalm 69 and verse 33. It says, For the Lord heareth the poor and despiseth not his prisoners. Paul said, just came to mind, he said he is the prisoner of the Lord, right? And he, you could look at that in two ways, I guess. He's the prisoner of God and is in the sense that he is captive by the Lord and he has to do the Lord's bidding. But then also Paul was literally a prisoner, and he was a prisoner for the sake of the Lord. So um, you could look at it both ways. But the Lord despises not his prisoners. He hears the poor, and whenever they cry unto him, whenever they're in need, or whenever they cry to him when they're oppressed by these wicked people, he hears from heaven and he has a special eye to the underdog, as we've talked about before in this study. And he pays attention when they're being oppressed. If we look in Ecclesiastes 5 and verse 8, sometimes it seems almost futile that what could we possibly do to fight against the oppression that's happening, especially when it's on a grand scale, like when it's governments or something doing it to you. But we should take heart at a verse like this. It says, If thou seest the oppression of the poor, and the vi and violent perverting of judgment and justice in a province, kind of like we see all the time, marvel not at the matter, for he that is higher than the highest regardeth, and there be higher than they. So God, who's higher than the highest, he regards, he pays attention, he sees the oppression, he remembers it, and he will take care of it. And the method that he uses, as we'll get into in just a second, is to turn the wicked's... Uh, uh, wickedness against them. Basically to destroy them with their own system that they've set up. It says in Proverbs 21 and verse 18 that the wicked will be a ransom for the righteous. And I have the I have a rough definition written down here of ransom and when you when you think about what a ransom is then it makes sense how this verse really fits into what we're talking about here. In Proverbs 21 and verse 18 it says, the wicked shall be a ransom for the righteous and the transgressor for the upright. So a ransom is a price that is paid to save somebody else, basically. Um, so if somebody takes somebody kidnap, if they kidnap somebody, then they want a ransom. They want you to pay some price to free the captive, right? Well, the wicked are that price that God pays 
to free the righteous who are under their control. So God destroys them and makes them the price. He makes them the sacrifice, as it were, and then he uses them to buy out his people. Kind of like, um, and the, the, actually the, the exact wording is used, when Israel came out of Egypt, it says that Egypt was a ransom for Israel. God destroyed the Egyptians in the Red Sea to save his people. So that was the price that he paid to get his people was the lives of those wicked Egyptians, uh, Pharaoh's armies. So here's how the Lord does it. He, he saves the poor uh, from the sword of the wicked by turning that very sword against themselves and using it against them. And uh, we got some verses here and verses that just state this. And then I was thinking about this and I, I looked up one verse that came to mind. And then the nice thing about notes in your Bible is I found some other ones that I'd totally forgotten about. So I got three examples of such of God doing this very thing of saving his poor people that are helpless by turning the wicked against themselves. But first of all, let's just look at some verses that says that God does this. If we look in Job 5, 5 uh, 15 through 16, Job 5, 15 through 16, the Lord uh, tells us this quite a few times here in the scripture. It's like he really wants us to know that, that this is uh, one of the ways that he operates. Job 5, 15 through 16, it says, He saveth the poor from the sword, from their mouth, and from the hand of the mighty. So the poor hath hope, and iniquity stoppeth her mouth. So he saves the poor. This doesn't tell us how he does it, but it says that he does save the, the poor from the mouth of the wicked. Like when David saved that lion, or the, the lamb, out of the mouth of the lion, right? Satan's called a roaring lion. The Lord um, is the ultimate type. The Lord Jesus Christ was the type, or David was the type of the Lord Jesus Christ. David saved that lion out of the mouth, lamb out of the mouth of the lion. The Lord saves his poor out of the mouth of the wicked, who are as a roaring lion, like their father the devil. Pastor, I'm sorry, when did David save a lamb? I'm showing my ignorance here from the mouth of a lion. He, um, remember when he went to, um, to defeat Goliath, and they were saying, you know, you're just basically here to, just to, to watch the battle, and what are you doing here? And then he offered to slay Goliath, and then Saul wants to know, well, what, what possible qualifications do you have? And he says, well, when I was watching the sheep, you know, I, I, he said he grabbed him by the beard and, and slew him. And so, yeah, uh, brave, brave guy there. Mm -hmm. Kid, really. David was a teenager, I, I'm pretty sure, at that time. I think he also took on a bear, too. A bear, yep, a lion and a bear. Yep, that's right. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, let's go to Psalm 12. In verse 5. Psalm 12 and verse 5. It says, For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now will I arise, saith the Lord, I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. So God hears the oppression. When you see the oppression of the poor, Solomon tells us, and the sighing of the needy, and isn't that what we do whenever we feel like we're we're exasperated and we just we're lost hope and you just sigh and you and there are other places in the scripture that talk about the Lord hears the sighing of his people. I'm, I'm pretty sure it was said of Israel whenever they were in, in bondage in Egypt that he heard their sighs and their cries. And when the Lord hears that, he's ready to save. And if you think about it, you got kids. And if you saw your one of your children oppressed or laying there hopeless and sighing and, and just not knowing what, what in the world they're possibly going to do, of course you're going to step in and help them, right? This is exactly what the Lord does. And if you saw somebody... Being lazy, they really are oppressed. Well, and it, that would depend too. And the Lord is probably discerning enough to figure out, you know, when we're being yeah, one or the other. But if you think about it, I mean, imagine, you're, imagine some bully picking on your kid and you come to his aid and you grab the bully's fist and start pounding it into his own head just to teach him a lesson or something. That's kind of what the Lord does. And I'll give you some examples of that where he literally takes their own weapons and, and destroys them with them. Let's look at Psalm 35 and verse 10 for another example. Psalm 35 and verse 10. Just like you could torment some kids. Stop hitting yourself as you're like pounding his own hand 
you know, that's, that's what the Lord can say to the, the Philistines and the other groups. Stop stabbing yourself. What are you doing? Psalm 35, 10 says, All my bones shall say, Lord, who is like unto thee which deliverest the poor from him that is too strong for him? Yea, the poor and the needy from him that spoileth him. And these verses are just, they're comforting to me because there have been Christians that have been persecuted over the centuries by, by powerful people, whether it was powerful churches like the Catholic Church or the Protestants or governments. And, and when it feels helpless, you just remember that the Lord, He's watching and He will, he will take care of us. I'll give you one more verse and then I'm going to give you some examples. Uh, Psalm 72 Verses 4, 12, and 13. Psalm 72, 4, 12, and 13. It says, He shall judge the poor of the people. He shall save the children of the needy. He shall break in pieces the oppressor. And you see this theme, poor, needy, and oppressor. And those three, three things seem to go together in, in all these verses. And then in verses 12 and 13, it says, For he shall deliver the needy when he crieth, the poor also, and him that hath no helper. He shall spare the soul, I'm sorry, he shall spare the poor and needy, he shall save the souls of the needy. Now let me give you some examples of these principles that we've just read there, of the Lord saving the, the poor and the downtrodden out of the hand of their enemies by turning the enemies against themselves. Let's look first of all at Judges chapter 7. This is back in the days of Gideon, one of the heroes of faith that we read about in Hebrews chapter 11. And in Judges chapter 7, 22 through 23, if you remember the story of Gideon, the Lord wanted him to get a host together to fight against, I think it was the Midianites, wasn't it? The Midianites. And so Gideon gathered, and I can't remember how many how many people now, I didn't, I didn't review the whole history here, but I think it was like, thousands, uh, 27,000 or something like that. I don't remember. It was a whole whole host that he gathered together there. And the Lord kept giving him these tests to whittle down the number of the people. And you remember he took them and, and had them drink water. And if they if they scooped the water up in their hand, then he was to keep them. But if they if they knelt, knelt down and, and basically drank it out without bringing it up in their hands, that he was not to take them. And, and there's some interesting lessons you can even learn from that, that, that God is looking for people who are circumspect, who are looking around, because if you're bowing down and, and slurping water out of the river, you're not paying attention, right? But if you're scooping it up and you're looking, you can still pay attention. So anyway, the Lord does several rounds here of eliminating people. Instead of raising a big army, the Lord whittles down an army to 300 men. And then he doesn't even have them take weapons with him. He has them take... Um, trumpets and um, like vessels with lights in them. And then he has them blow, the, with, so he's got a trumpet in one hand and a vessel in the other one, and he has them blow the trumpets and then smash the vessels and then the lights appear and, and the, the enemies see up on the hill this whole vast array of lights and they see 300 of them and they're just assuming that there's a whole huge army up there and with all the noise and the trumpets and everything. And what the Lord does is basically confounds them and they end up turning in on themselves and, and destroying themselves. And we read about that there in verse 22. It says, And the three hundred blew the trumpets, and the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow, even throughout all the host. And the host fled to Beth Shetta in Zerarath, uh, and to the border of uh, Abel-Mahola, unto Tabath. And the men of Israel gathered themselves together out of Naphtali, and out of Asher, and out of Manasseh, and pursued after the Midianites. So the Lord does this incredible thing where Gideon can't possibly imagine how his poor and needy little band of 300 men are going to go up against tens of thousands, how this is ever going to work. Human reasoning would say, we're screwed, right? And yet the Lord turns their swords against each other and puts some kind of fear in the camp or something, and they destroy each other. Literally, what David said would happen in Psalm 37, 15, their swords shall enter into their own heart and their bows shall be broken. <laughs> they end up using their swords to, to slay each other. There's another example of this. 
in 1 Samuel 14, 19 through 23. 1 Samuel 14, 19 through 23. And the Lord will not only do this in a physical sense, He'll do that, but He can also do it whenever we are uh, being oppressed by people who maybe aren't trying to kill us, but trying to persecute us or put us in prison or something. In the, um, the story of the Apostle Paul comes to mind, whenever the Pharisees were um, trying to, to take him into captivity, and he realized that there were Pharisees and Sadducees, and the Pharisees believed in the resurrection, and angels and spirits, and the, and the, the, the Sadducees denied both. And when Paul recognizes that, and you probably remember the study that we did on it years ago, um, he says, Men and brethren, I'm a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, for the hope of the resurrection, I call it in question. And the Pharisees say, well, Resurrection, yeah, that's what we believe. And the, and the Sadducees say, we don't believe in any resurrection. And then they start fighting against among each other, and, and Paul's let loose. So sometimes the Lord can do that um, in a physical confrontation or in a spiritual confrontation as well. But let's look at 1 Samuel 14, 19-23. This is when um, Saul was battling against the Philistines, and the Lord did a similar thing that he did for Gideon. First uh, Samuel fourteen, nineteen through twenty-three. If I can ever get there, okay. It says, and it came to pass while Saul talked unto the priest that the noise that was in the host of the Philistines went on and increased. And Saul said unto the priest, Withdraw thine hand. And Saul and all the people that were with him assembled themselves, and they came to the battle. And behold, every man's sword was against his fellow, and there was a great discomfiture. Moreover, the Hebrews that were with the Philistines before that time, which went up with them into the camp from the country round about, even they also turned to be with the Israelites that were with Saul and Jonathan. Likewise, the men of Israel which had hid themselves in Mount Ephraim, when they heard that the Philistines fled, even they also followed hard after them in the battle. And the Lord saved Israel that day, and the battle passed over unto beth -Avon. So the Lord saves his poor and needy little flock of Israel, Israelites there, by turning the Philistines against themselves, turning their own swords against themselves and destroying them by the same means by which they sought to destroy Israel. So that's that's the way that God works. Let me give you... Wouldn't Saul and David be an example of it too? Because Saul was chasing him to kill David all the time. And then David, or Saul ended up using the sword on himself. That's a great example, wow. yep. Yep. And David, and, th and then that's a, another good example of why we don't try to take things into our own hands. Because David could have killed Saul on a couple of occasions. And he didn't. He wouldn't touch the Lord's anointed. And he let the Lord get the glory by literally turning Saul's sword upon himself. Yeah, that's an excellent example. Let me give you one more in 2 Chronicles 20, 22 through 25. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And just remember, the God that lived in the olden times is just the same today. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we might think it seems impossible, but what do you think Gideon's men thought? <laughs> you know? So it's not impossible. The Lord, He can deliver by many or by few. 2 Corinthians 20, 22 through 20. Uh, 2 Chronicles. There is no 2 Corinthians 20. 2 Chronicles 20, 22. And when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, which were come against Judah, and they were smitten. And the children of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir. All these guys were confederate against Judah, and now they're all fighting against each other. Utterly to slay and destroy them. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, every one helped to destroy another. I just love it. That's great. Let's read down to verse 25. And when Judah came toward the watchtower in the wilderness, they looked unto the multitude, and behold, there were dead bodies fallen to the earth, and none escaped. And when Jehoshaphat 
and his people came to take away the spoil of them, they found among them in abundance both riches with the dead bodies and precious jewels which they stripped off for themselves more than they could carry away. And they were three days in gathering of the spoil. It was so much. So not only does God turn the wicked sword against himself, but then, as it says in Proverbs, the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. And they pillage those guys, and it took them three whole days to gather up all the jewels and precious things that they had with them. I don't know what kind of soldiers these are. I wouldn't be taking my life savings out on the battlefield with me if I were these guys, but for some reason they took a lot of riches with them and jewels and it was to Israel's benefit. Maybe they pillaged along the way. Well, that, could the that could be. That could be. Yeah. The next battle. That's an excellent point. And that's what armies used to do. Mm -hmm. You know, now we just, I don't know. It's like they tell us, oh, the Iraq war will pay for itself. Not that we should have been involved in there anyway, but it's, it seems like we don't even do that kind of thing anymore. They just give big checks to the defense contractors or something and screw the people and don't don't even pillage the so-called enemy so i don't even know how that works but got anyway paid yeah somebody got paid i'm sure the lord specializes in judging and punishing the wicked with their own devices and i'm just going to give you some verses here that tells us that this is how the lord does things proverbs 11 verses 5 through 6. And we ought to be careful and cautious because the Lord punishes his people by the same methods. You remember Proverbs chapter 1, when wisdom cries and, and they reject it, then he says, thou make them eat of the fruit of their own ways and be filled with their own devices. So God will punish us with our own wickedness as well, which is one of the, the worst judgments that he can give to us. It's just to let us just have it our way and do what we want and then suffer the horrible consequences for it. Proverbs chapter 11, verses 5 through 6. It says, The righteousness of the perfect shall direct his way, but the wicked shall fall by his own wickedness. The righteousness of the upright shall deliver them, but transgressors shall be taken in their own naughtiness. And I have some examples uh, at the end of this string of verses as well of this actually happening and how how specifically the Lord does it. But this is what he does. They fall by their own wickedness. And they're taken in their own naughtiness. In their own evil devices, they end up being caught in their own snare. They fall into their own, into their own hole that they've dug. Or they've digged. I think it's digged. I, think they've, I don't think they've dug. They've dug is proper. I think it's they've digged. Proverbs 27, uh, 20, 26, 27. They, they dug, they have digged. Have digged. Yes, have digged. It's one of those things that doesn't sound right. They have digged. Yeah. Like hanged. You'd say that yeah. um, they hanged him instead of they hung him, I'm pretty sure. like the, At least the King James will say it. If like Judas went and hanged himself instead of hung, went and hung himself. Hanged, yeah. Yeah. But uh, they, they hung and they have hanged. <laughs> Is that right? I don't know if it's have hanged or have. I don't know. Verb in yeah, I'm not sure about that. Like sing, sung. Which one's with the helping verb? Well, sung, it's have sung. Have sung. Yeah, so sing, sang, have, have sung. <laughs> if it follows that rule, like yeah. have hung, have sung. Could, could be. Have, have dug. I could have no, have I, I'd have, I'd, I'd, I'd have to look that one up. I don't know. It's like Haman and Esther. He was trying to hang. That's exactly Biden. right. Why do you keep, ta why don't I just let you do the Bible study? <laughs> I don't get yeah. that point. What do you want to name the baby Esther? No, yeah. Oh. <laughs> He's going to tell. Yeah. No, that's exactly that's that's one of the examples. Uh, let's see. Where was I before we get to that one though? In um, Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, Proverbs 26 and verse 27. It says, "Whoso diggeth a pit shall fall therein, and he that rolleth a stone, it will return upon him." Kind of reminds me of um, some of those guys. This was a, a dirty trick that that the U.S. played on the Iraqi insurgents. They would um, they flooded the country, I guess, or made supplies anyway of these mortars 
that were designed to blow up as soon as you dropped them in the tube instead of because they're supposed to you drop them in the tube and then they they fire out and wherever they land and they blow up well they they made them so as soon as you drop them in the tube they blow up so you just find these guys that are just laying there dead and they were trying to you know mortar a, the enemy or whatever and so anyway this is kind of like what the the lord sort of does this where he he lets you fall into your own hole that you dig and uh, destroys the wicked that way. Uh, let's look at Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 8. That's right. That's right. Yep. And that's, that's a, I mean, that's probably one of the, it's a it's a good form of punishment in a way because it's it's not only painful but it's humiliating because you you end up being if you were trying to hurt somebody else in some way when you end up the same thing happens to you that you were trying to do to them it's kind of a double whammy and, and maybe that's why the Lord does it that way. Searching moment. Mm-hmm. Yep. Ecclesiastes ten and verse eight it says, "He that diggeth a pit shall fall into it, and whoso breaketh an hedge, a serpent." shall bite him. Breaketh and hedge, I suppose, if you're maybe trying to get into your neighbor's property or something like that, and you do that, and you end up getting bitten by a, a serpent. Trespass. Let's look at Judges. Let me give you a, an example here. of uh, I got one of three, actually four examples of the Lord doing this type of judgment. Uh, Judges chapter 9, verses 52 through 57. And this one would be exceptionally ignominious because this wicked man ended up being killed by a woman. And to be killed by a woman in battle was, you know, not exactly something that one would be proud of. Though he wouldn't have really had much time to be ashamed of it because whenever a rock crushes down through your skull, you're pretty well toast quickly. But uh, in Judges 9, 52 through 57, it says, In Abimelech came unto the tower and fought against it and went hard unto the door of the tower to burn it with fire. So he's going to kill these people in the tower. He, they've, they've come up against the people and the people have fled into the tower and the women went up there to try to save themselves. It's kind of like in the scary movie whenever the, the woman always runs upstairs whenever the guy comes into the house, you know, like runs back into a corner where you can't get away or something. Well, that's what happens to these people. And here are the poor and needy. Here are these people that they're, they're thinking they're going to be burned alive in this tower and watch what happens. And a certain woman cast a piece of a millstone upon Abimelech's head, and all to break his skull. Then he called hastily unto the young man his armor-bearer, and said unto him, Draw thy sword. I take it back, he wasn't killed right away. Draw thy sword, and slay me, that men say not of me, a woman slew me. And his young man thrust him through, and he died. So, yeah, I guess... The Lord really had a good time with him because instead of just letting him be killed by a woman, he let him have to lay there and admit the fact that he had been pretty well killed by a woman and, and suffer that reproach. And when the men of Israel saw that Abimelech was dead, they departed every man unto his place. Thus God, listen to this, thus God rendered the wickedness of Abimelech, which he did unto his father in slaying his 70 brethren, and all the evil of the men of Shechem did God render upon their heads, and upon them came the curse of Jotham, the son of Jeroboam. So the Lord rendered upon their heads, literally, the wickedness that they were going to do or that they did, had done, to other people. Let's look at another example in Daniel 6, in verse 24. You'll be very familiar with this one. Daniel 6, 24. You remember what happened to Daniel? They made the law that you couldn't make any petition to God or man for 30 days except for the king. And Daniel goes up as he had a four time and he prayed three times a day in his house. They find out about it. They tell the king. The king had made the law that you get cast into the den of lions. And they cast Daniel into the den of lions. And the God shut the lions' mouths, we read, and robbed them of their prey. And then what happened? Then the guys that had conspired to put Daniel in the lion's den, they get put in the lion's den. The Lord puts them in the pit that they had dug or digged for Daniel. 
Daniel 6 and verse 24. Did I say 23, 24? 24. And the king commanded, and they brought those men which had accused Daniel, and they cast them into the den of lions, them, their children, and their wives. And the lions had the mastery over them, and break all their bones in pieces, or ever they came at the bottom of the den. So they were judged with the very judgment that they were going to punish Daniel with. Mm -hmm. The Lord turned it right around on them. They broke a hedge and got bitten by a serpent. They dug a pit, they fell into it. They rolled a stone, it rolled back upon them. That's what the Lord does. It'd be terrifying because these lions were incredibly aggressive. Because before they even got down, they're coming and oh, yeah. viciously attacking. You got children, your wives, everything oh. you love right there getting be horrible. Right to the bone. And you're trying to scramble and all the adrenaline. It's very terrifying. And the lions were hungry because they didn't get a meal from Daniel <laughs> was the no night before. Meal meal. Yeah. They were high, very aggressive. They couldn't even get to the bottom. Yeah. These lions were on. Oh. That would be a horrible, absolutely horrible death. Yep. And you think about it, that's what happened to Christians in the Roman Empire. They were fed to the lions. and oh, That would just be terrifying. I think great white shark would be worse, but I don't know for sure. Yeah. I would just hope if he at least got me like right in the neck and just kind of bit my head off yeah. right away. or That would be so That would be better. It would be better if you just he starts yeah, we, cutting off limbs one at a time or something. You know? You're not getting me without a fight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How's that going to go? Yeah, you, you definitely wouldn't want to start swinging at a shark or something because you start biting your hands off. You may as well just kind of hold your arms back and... <laughs> <laughs> Hope he bites you in the head. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just... Oh, he missed uh. again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, All right, let's go to Andrea's example in Esther. Esther 7, 9 through 10. Back in the days of Esther, there was a king and he wanted his wife to come out and parade around in front of his buddies and she didn't do it, so he got rid of the, the queen and then Esther ends up becoming the queen and then uh, there's a guy named Haman and Haman hates Esther's uncle Mordecai and he, he had wanted everybody, he was such a proud man, he wanted everybody to bow down to him and Mordecai, because he was a Jew, wouldn't bow down to him, and Haman hated him for that. And so then Haman determines he's going to kill Mordecai, and he builds this gallows, like 70 feet high or something, I'll have to we'll read it here in a second. He builds this great big gallows that he plans to hang Mordecai on the next day. Well, then the king, Mordecai had saved the king previously and never been awarded or rewarded for it. And the king has trouble sleeping one night. He has them bring out the chronicles, uh, the history, basically, of the kingdom, boring as can be, to put you to sleep. And he reads about Mordecai and saving the king. And he says, well, what, what's, what's been done for this guy? And they say, well, nothing. And, and he, so he calls Haman in there. He says, Haman, what should I do to honor a man that's done great things for the king, basically? And, of course, Haman, being the proud fool that he is, thinks, well, he's talking about me. And he says, oh, I'll put a great, put a ring on his finger and put a robe on him and put him on the royal apparel and, and make this great big procession and all this stuff. And he's, he's like, okay, well, go do this for Mordecai, that, Mordecai then. And, and, of course, Haman's angry and, and then um, ends up begging his life for Queen Esther. And, and, and the guys go in there and it looks like he's trying to have his way with Esther or something. And the king's really angry and... He says, go hang Haman. And they say, well, he's got this big gallows already. And he's like, well, hang him on the gallows that he made for Mordecai. So talk about the Lord turning the whole thing around. It was quite a story. But let's just read the punchline there in, in Esther 7 and verses 9 through 10. And after all that talking, I still didn't even manage to make it to Esther. Esther 7, 9 through 10. It says, in Harbona, one of the chamberlains said before the king, Behold also the gallows, 50 cubits high. So, yeah, that's 75 feet high. 50 cubits high, which Haman had made for Mordecai, who had spoken good for the king, standeth in the house of Haman. Then the king said, Hang him thereon. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then was the king's wrath pacified. When you make it that high, is that to terrify someone mm -hmm. first before their neck cracks? I would guess so. Because you're dropping for quite a, a good chunk of time. Yeah, I mean, if you dropped them from the top, yeah, I wouldn't even think. I think you'd just be decapitated 
or something. It'll they probably, may not drop them with force or, when it's that because it's so high everyone could see them. They may let you and, strangle. Oh, uh, that could be. They slowly just let you Yeah, go. that could 70, be. I mean, why would you build gallows 75 feet high? Just to make, make a big spectacle of it, oh. I suppose. Yeah. And you would you'd yeah. be better served by letting them slowly suffocate up that high where yeah. they could see that yeah. snap in their neck. Yeah. Yep. So yeah, there is a great example of digging a pit and falling into it yourself. Build a gallows to hang, to hang your enemy on, and you end up being hanged on it the, the next day. And you know, Mordecai might have thought that I mean, here he is, poor and needy. Mordecai, I don't know if it's Mordecai or Mordecai, the, the, the Cambridge pronounces it Mordecai, but Mordecai is easier to say, but anyway, um, it doesn't say, but did Mordecai pray to the Lord to protect him from this wicked Haman, kind of seeing the writing on the wall? I wouldn't be surprised, though it doesn't say it, I'm kind of speculating, but, and here the Lord steps in and an impossible situation gets turned around by means where Mordecai couldn't have even, couldn't have even conceived of it ever happening and there Haman's swinging from his own gallows let me give you one more example this is probably the best example and this is in the book of Hebrews Hebrews chapter 2 so there was a time when wicked men kings of the earth people of Israel Pharisees the devil himself conspired against the Lord Jesus Christ to put him to death and by the very means by which they used to put him to death, the Lord ended up, through his death, destroying them. Talk about digging a pit and falling into it, not even realizing it. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14 says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also, speaking of Jesus Christ, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. The devil orchestrates his death, and in doing so, it ends up being his own demise. Mm -hmm. He dug a pit and fell into it, mm -hmm. tried to roll a stone, and it came back upon him. Right. Now, the Lord will overthrow the house of the wicked and make the upright to flourish. Um, Haman, or Mordecai, is a, a great example of that. Uh, Proverbs 14 and verse 11. Proverbs 14, 11. <clears throat> People that killed Jesus on the cross, weren't they hung or weren't they crucified if they tried to get out of the, when they were surrounded by the Romans? Yeah, they were. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. That is true. At least those that would have lived that long, that was 40 years later. But some of those guys, some of those Jews that would have killed him, I mean, imagine if you're in your 20s, maybe and you're a Roman soldier or something. Uh, or, a, or a Jew that, that called for Jesus' death, not a Roman soldier, but a Jew that called for Jesus' death at that time, 40 years later, you're still 60s, mm -hmm. and very well could have been one of the ones that was crucified as they tried to escape Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I never thought about that, but yeah. There's a lot of crucifixion around that city. I, I think if I remember right, reading Josephus or somebody, that there were no trees left in the whole area there around Jerusalem. Just they, circled Yeah. Because they were using it because... Using them to crucify people. Yeah. If you stayed in the city, the infighting was so horrible that you were desperate to get out. If you got out, the Romans would let you get out and put you on a crucifix yeah. right then and there. And then the Jews were trying to get out with their money, and they were swallowing coins. And when the Romans found that out, then they were cutting open their bellies to make sure they didn't have any coins in their stomachs. And Yeah. It's been a real uplifting with the great white shark, oh, uh, yeah. the lions, and now the two yeah, well. bellies. I don't know if I can take one. Well, <laughs> there's a mixture of uh, yes. edification and uh, yeah, disgust. Well, and that's, that's true. I mean, you kind of, whether it's true or not, you kind of look at Jews as ones that care about their money. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. kind of apropos that they die by that money. Yeah. And it's interesting, there are people in the Bible who are described as whose God is their belly, yes. you know, and their God was in their belly, yep. and yeah, their, belly's got, yep. yeah, their belly's got ripped open. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Proverbs 14 and verse 11. 
It says, The house of the wicked shall be overthrown, but the tabernacle of the upright shall flourish. Israel is a good example of that. Um, they were overthrown, and the believers that left uh, were, were uh, flourished. Mordecai is an example of that, and Daniel and the people that um, came after him. Um, lots of examples of that in the scripture. The Gentiles, uh, <clears throat> gospel to the Gentiles, and then gave the church. Yep. Yeah. That's right. That's, yeah, that's great. Their tabernacle flourished. Yep. Mm -hmm. Let's turn to uh, 1 Samuel 2 4. See here that God will destroy the weapons and the means of the wicked. 1 Samuel 2 and verse 4. It says, The bows of the mighty men are broken, and they that stumbled are girded with strength. You see the contrast? God breaks the bow of the wicked, but they that stumbled, the poor and needy, that the wicked were trying to destroy, they're girded with strength. So God strengthens the poor at the same time destroying the wicked. And the ultimate of this is going to be at the second coming, right? When the Lord finally destroys all the wicked and the righteous are exalted and they shine as lights in the kingdom of their Father. Do I have time for verse 16? Uh, let's see, it's been 41 minutes. I don't know. I, I We could do verse 16 or we could wait till next time. What time is it? It's 7 o'clock. Why don't we just wait till next time? Are you okay with that? Is 41 minutes enough for you? Okay. All right, we'll do verse 16 next time, and that's a total change of, of gears anyway. So anyway, just remember, the next time you feel like you're oppressed and you're downtrodden, remember Mordecai. Seemed like the situation was impossible. Remember Daniel, impossible situation. Remember the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember um, all those examples that we looked at. Remember Gideon and his men that the Lord saved um, miraculously by turning the wicked against themselves. So... Um, if we ever are oppressed and they come after us, just remember that the Lord can turn that thing around in a heartbeat and he can use the devices of the wicked against themselves. Thank you. <clears throat> that clock says eight, almost eight o'clock. That's because that clock Oh, it was never turned back. Turned.